Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read to you from verse 35 onwards, all the way to the end. Verse 35 to the end. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might use, uh, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in des deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Above all these, though commanded through faith, did not receive what was promised, uh, commended through faith, uh, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. As you know, we've been teaching from Hebrews chapter 11, and we are now down to our last passage here, starting from verse 35. You remember that last few weeks I've been teaching from verse 32 to 34. And uh, that is the end of a lot of examples that he has taken from the Old Testament to illustrate faith. All are very positive examples of great faith working in people. And uh, these people achieved a lot through faith. And finally, he comes down to verse 32 and says, I got a lot more to say about a lot more people in the Old Testament. And he mentions six of them. But he says, well, I can't mention everyone and talk about everyone. We can, but no time. And then he gives nine achievements of faith. And we went through that, the nine achievements of faith. And that is what is found in verse 33 and 34. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. But then in verse 35, the whole uh, tenor of the whole passage changes. Verse 35 takes us into another kind of passage. Because here it says, women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mockings and floggings, even chains and imprisons. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. So it's talking about all the suffering, all those who suffered for their faith <clears throat> and how much they suffered and so on. So this whole passage is about suffering. Uh, up to verse 34, it's all about great victories, great positive victories and, and overcoming many situations and problems and so on. But verse 35 onwards, it is about suffering, suffering for their faith. Uh, therefore, some people have titled this section separately and given a, they've given a title, for example, say, some have titled it as the other side of faith. Now, I don't like that particular title because that's a very popular title. Everybody talks about it. They say, what about the other side of faith? What they mean is, well, up to verse 34, it's all positive. It's all victories. It is all wonderful things happening. Impossible things becoming possible by faith and so on. But verse 35 onwards, it is people being killed, sawn asunder, People walking around in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, put down, and so on. So it's that kind of a thing. It's a story of how faith failed to protect them. Faith failed, they say, to protect them, and how 
these people were walking by faith but there was no success they were not protected their lives were taken they were tortured and so on so they call it the other side of faith meaning the one side which is up to verse 34 is all victories it's all fantastic and wonderful and verse 35 onwards it's negative not so positive it's all failures and defeats and so on i don't like that title particularly i want to title this page different this particular passage differently i want to title it differently because i don't see it that way i don't see it as a passage that shows that uh, these people have failed uh, living by faith uh, that god failed them god gave them up to die that god has given up on them and that uh, they had to give their lives for god god did not in the end protect them therefore it's a passage of failure i don't see it that way in fact i see it the exact opposite way i feel if i see it as the highest expression of faith and not only me some of the great grandest writers on this passage commentators and so on see it this way uh they see this as the height of faith they see it as the pinnacle of faith therefore i want to title it as the pinnacle of faith pinnacle is the highest point now you remember when we learned about abraham in chapter 11 we showed that abraham's faith went through four different stages uh, one stage better than the other you know he grew in faith the first stage was where he learned that god will meet his needs that in the midst of famine god took him and made him rich supplied all his needs so he was able to see that god is able to wonderfully meet his needs that is a wonderful faith lesson i'm sure you have learned that lesson i've learned that lesson that god can meet our needs wonderfully he learned that that's the first thing he learned about god second thing he learned was that god gives victory over enemies that no weapon formed against him shall prosper because god is with him god has a calling upon his life he has a mission god said that he will make his name great and god said he'll bless those who will bless him curse those who curse him and through him the nations of families of the earth will be blessed what does that mean it means that jesus is going to be born through the seed of abraham through the descendants of abraham and he's going to become the savior of the world and that is the only way through which that particular promise can be fulfilled that is through him all the families of the earth can be blessed in only one way and that is the savior must be born through him he must become the savior of the world die for the salvation of everyone and become the savior of the world that is the only way it can be fulfilled so abraham had a wonderful calling wonderful purpose and so on so the first thing he learned was to see that god meets all his needs wonderfully because he has called him second thing that he learned was that no enemy can stand against him the faith was reaching to higher levels you know just with 318 household servants he goes to war against five kings and beats them wins against them the third level uh, to which the faith his faith goes is where he begins to see god as the god of the impossible where he saw that god can take him at 100 years of age and take his wife who's 90 years of age and give them both children give them both a child that was showing him that god is the god of the impossible that was that took great faith that is a higher level of faith so first he learned god meets needs second he learned that god protects against all enemies and third thing he learned that god makes all things that is impossible possible but the fourth level is the highest level what is the fourth level when god told abraham to take his only son and sacrifice him on that mountain that abraham gets up early in the morning and leaves and goes and is ready to do that that he is able to believe god in such a way that 
even when god commanded him to go and offer his only son that he got at the age of 100 when his wife was 90 years of age he was willing to go and sacrifice his son just because god told him i would say that's the pinnacle of abraham's faith that's the height that's the top most point of abraham's faith at that point his faith reached the highest point it was greater faith than all other faiths that he showed all other lessons that he learned now he's got to show more faith he's got to go and offer his son as a sacrifice and he was willing to do that he was ready to do that god had to stop him he would have done it because by now he has understood something about this god this god of abraham that this god is a promise keeper that this god will not fail him that whatever he says he'll do that god will carry out every one of his promises therefore because god has said that in you shall all the pro- all the nations of the earth be blessed he understands that isaac must live in isaac shall your seed be god told him when abraham said well you know ishmael is born already so i can still have a, a seed through ishmael god refused to entertain that he said only through isaac shall your seed be that means isaac has to live that means jesus has to come in the lineage of isaac he must become the savior in order for the promises to be fulfilled and that means isaac cannot die and even if he dies he must be raised back to life and abraham is ready to believe that that even if he went and cut his son and offered him a sacrifice and burnt him as to ashes that god will from the ashes raise for him his son back and then he'll come back down with his son when he leaves his servants there at the foot of the mountain he tells them my son and i will go and worship god and we will come back he says he didn't say i'm going to come back alone because i'm going to offer my son he says we will come back when the son asked where is the sacrifice we've got fire we got wood we got everything where is the sacrifice he said god will see to it god will see to it he knew that something is going to happen god has to do something he's got to either provide a sad he's got to either provide a substitute or he's got to perform a resurrection from the dead in order to give isaac back that is why i say that was the pinnacle the highest point of abraham's faith now i that is why i say that this passage was 35 onwards to the end we will title it as the pinnacle of faith because we've say, seen faith working so many things the achievements of faith in so many ways people were thrown in fire but they came out without even the smell of fire on them daniel was thrown in the lions den but god sent an angel and shut the angel's mouth and daniel came out all these things, wonderful things happened but this passage from verse 35 onwards is greater because now people are not not only able to believe that they can go into the fire and come back safe not only believe that they can go into lions den and come out safe they are able to believe that they can give their bodies to be tortured and be dead that god will give them back their bodies that they can believe god to that extent that they can boldly die and close their eyes that god will give their bodies back to them one day that is how they died so it is not by as a result of failure they died it's not a defeat they gave their lives to god by faith in fact verse 13 says about people that lived by faith they died by faith also it says every christian i believe dies by faith when a christian dies when he closes his eyes he knows that very same second he'll open his eyes in heaven and he'll live there with god and then he believes that his body which is kept in the grave will be raised up one day and be given back to him that in his body in his immortal body he will see his loved ones 
and uh, he will uh, have immortality in the body and live with God forever. The believer believes that. When every believer closes his eyes at the time of death, he has this hope of a resurrection, immortal body, immortality of life, and uh, immortal body and all of that. All this thing is there. Even Jesus is the greatest. Uh, Jesus showed this faith. He is, the, uh, he is the one that shows the example of this faith very profoundly. You know, God decided way back in eternity past, even before the world was made, that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, will be the one to come into the world, die on the cross, and provide salvation. So he was designated to be the Savior, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. When the time came, when the fullness of time came, the Bible says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. 4. So this son who was designated to be the Savior from eternity past, now was sent into the earth 2,000 years ago. God sends him. He knows that he is coming there with a body just to die. Hebrews says that. The book of Hebrews chapter 2 says, a body you have given me. Why? Why God gave a body to the second person of Trinity? So that he may die, shed his blood, make himself a sacrifice for mankind. So he knows coming into the world, this person, second person of the Trinity, is coming into this world through the womb of Mary, born as a child, knowing all the time that God has given to him a body. He was equal with God. He was God. He's the second person of the Trinity, but he's now coming in a body. Why a body? Because he's got to die, shed his blood. He's got a blood, bone, flesh body, just like us. Comes and lives here. Then finally, the time comes for him to die. He didn't die an ordinary death. He was tortured, just like we read just now from verse 35. He was tortured, literally. Beaten black and blue. His body became like a plowed field, the Bible says. Very sad. Tortured like anything. And taken to Golgotha. And there on the cross, he was nailed to the cross. And died there in that condition. When he died, listen to this. When he died, he says, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. In other words, you know what he was saying? He said, Father, you sent me into this world to do this work. I've finished it. And you told me to go die. And I believe you. I believe that you will raise me up on the third day. I believe you. And by believing you, I give this life. I'm going to die right now. Close my eyes and give up my spirit and die here. And I trust that you will not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 16. Peter preaches on it after Jesus rose again. That the prophecy was fulfilled in the resurrection. That prophet already prophesied that God will not leave his soul in hell. And that Prophet was David. He was not prophesying about himself. And uh, Peter says, David's grave is still with us. Therefore, that prophecy is not about David himself. Even though he spoke it saying, you will not leave my soul in hell. He was prophesying about someone else. And that is Jesus. His grave is empty, he says. So when Jesus died, he was closing his eyes and dying, giving his spirit into the Father's hands, fully believing that the Father, when the time came three days later, will give it back to him. Give his spirit back to him and raise him up from the grave. When he was living on this earth, he said that. He said, destroy this temple and I will build it, raise it back up in three days. And they thought he's talking about the temple. They said, how can this man destroy this temple and then raise it up in three days. Do you know how, does he know how many years it took to build? How much it cost to build? How can he destroy it and build it in three days? They misunderstood it. They thought he was talking about the temple. That's one of the accusations for crucifying him. 
that he said destroy this temple i'll build it in 3 days he was not talking about the temple his body his earthly body when he lived here has become the temple when jesus came from the time jesus came god was not living in the temple the temple was empty the god who was known to have been living in the holy of holies known to be the place where god dwells is empty now where is god god was in christ paul says god was in jesus walking around in galilee in capernaum doing miracles blessing people delivering people from demon possessions healing the sick and so on god was in christ in that body god dwelt that body had become the holy of holies and jesus said destroy this temple this body he was talking about his body destroy this temple and it will be raised back in 3 days the third day it will be raised back from the dead that is why on the cross when he died he looks at the father and says father into your hands i commend my spirit in other words he's saying father i trust you that you said that you will raise me back up and i believe you and i give my spirit into your hands my father if god the father told us to give our lives will we give before we close our eyes thousand questions will be there what if he forgot what if i give my spirit into his hands and he forgot three days become three months or three years 30 years or 300 years or 3000 years what will happen if god just left me in there to rot and go dust to dust jesus believes it will not happen that god will indeed raise him up on the third day that god never 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 ever fails to fulfill his promise that what he said he will do he totally believes the father that's the height of his faith giving his life on the cross of calvary as a result of his faith being at the highest point he believes god totally he knows that god will do it that god will not ever fail that's why i believe yes up to verse 34 you see the great achievements of faith they achieved great things by faith but verse 35 onwards where they give their life to be tortured to be killed to suffer that is greater faith that is why i want to call it the pinnacle of faith now it's taken me so long to just give the title <laughs> but i think it's worth it to spend the time to talk about this because you need to think about these things in this in this ways we don't just give titles just to be giving titles something that sounds nice we really believe that giving one's life is not just resigning ourselves to failure and saying well god can't save me he just wants me to die i'll just sacrifice myself no 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 giving one's life to die giving one's body to be burned giving ready to be cut up and thrown out as dead is the highest kind of faith because such a person believes that god will put that body back and give it back to him in good shape that's the highest faith so the pinnacle of faith so <laughs> a lot of people have their wrong idea about verse 35 onwards they say well one fellow told me what are you going to do about verse 35 onwards i said what's the matter with 35 he says because everybody's dying there suffering there how are you going to preach about that you always preach about faith achieving great things like this how are you going to preach about this suffering some people only preach about suffering you know they believe christian life is a life of suffering if you're not suffering you're a christian you're not a christian they're doubtful whether you're a christian or not that's too much that's another extreme that tamil people have gone to i think tamil nadu are specialists in this you know they are suffering champions you know they've gone the other way they think if you're a christian you must suffer have you suffered for christ i'd like to suffer but where i'm not able to suffer you know 
so far. Nobody's, nobody's making me suffer. I'm not joking, really. <laughs> nobody's ready to burn me or cut me up. Or <laughs> and I thank God for that. That people are a lot better nowadays. They're not coming after you to kill you or anything like that. We live in a democracy. We live in a, uh, with a great sense of freedom and liberty to believe and propagate and so on. Thank God for all this, you know, though. The whole world is, is like that, you know. Very few places they'll do what these people have done to these people, you know. What we read in the Bible is not possible in most of the places of the world today. Even if you want to suffer like this, you cannot suffer. Hello. So some people are doubting whether I believe in suffering. Well, all your doubts will clear today. And in the weeks to come, whether I believe in suffering or not. But we should not be one-sided, you know. We should not just think that Christian life is just suffering, suffering and suffering and more suffering, you know. That is not a right balance. The right balance is Christian life is a lot of blessings in this life and in the life to come, but it does involve suffering also when it is required and when it is needed. You do not, you should not have kind of a martyr complex. Some people are all the time, it feels like they're asking somebody to kill them, you know. Come on, stone me, kill me, do something, you know. They're irritating people, you know, wanting to experience some persecution so they can say, I'm persecuted for Jesus. And I'm not that type. I thank God for the good life. <laughs> I thank God for all the blessings. But do I believe in suffering? Yes. If there comes a time where you have to give your life for Jesus, you should be ready for it. Because life, when you give it for Jesus, you will get it back in good shape. There is no doubt about it. You can give it back. Just like you receive all the blessings from God in this life, you can boldly and safely give your life. If it's for Jesus, you can give it because he will give it back to you in good shape. And that takes a lot of faith. And every one of us should grow to that kind of faith. Amen? Are you there? Everybody say the pinnacle of faith. <laughs> pinnacle is the highest point. The highest point, point of faith is where a person reaches a point where he's ready to even die for Jesus, even to give his life for the sake of the faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what we want to talk about. All right. Now, you know, this is a major subject, you know. And so I got to have some time to deal with it. So we'll look at it a few weeks. But the thing is this. When you look at passage like this, where people are cut up and killed and tortured and, you know, and so on. When you look at all the suffering, then the whole problem of evil and suffering comes up. And that is often used as a challenge to the Christian faith, to challenge the Christian faith. A lot of people say, if you say your God is a good God and is an all-powerful God, if there is such a God, as you say, why is there so much evil and suffering in this world? It's a big question. It's a philosophical question. People use it to challenge the Christian faith, challenge the idea of God, challenge the idea of the kind of God that we preach. You say your God is a mighty God, almighty God. You say that your God is a good God. If your God is really there, such a, if, the, if such a God does really exist, then why is there so much evil and suffering in this world? A lot has been written about it and a lot has been so spoken about it. The problem of pain, the problem of evil and suffering is a very major subject. The argument goes like this. If your God is so good and so almighty, then why doesn't he care to intervene and why, why can't he stop all that that is happening right now, the evil and the sufferings? They always point out to things like 9-11 and the tsunami 
you know, like one guy said the other day, where was your God on 9-11? He thinks he's very smart. Where is your God? Where did he go? What was he doing? Why didn't he protect the people, the thousands of people that died? Where was your God when thousands of people died all across this part of the world because of the tsunami in so many countries? Where was your God? So they say, since he didn't stop it, does that mean that he doesn't have the power to stop it? And you say he has the power to stop it. Then why didn't he stop it? Doesn't he have the love and the compassion to stop it? Is he not a good God? If he can't stop it, and if he didn't stop it, then it's possible that he doesn't even exist. Such a God doesn't even exist. They question the very existence of God. And... Uh, How do Christians answer this question? Because that is what we're going to try to answer this week and, and the next few weeks to come. How do Christian people answer this question? Now, the sad thing is, a lot of times churches don't talk about this. And, uh, and when they do talk about it, they don't really go into it. And therefore, Christians don't have the answers to talk about it. They don't have any idea, even to personally benefit from such a truth even if they're not answering some great philosophical challenge that is put forth, they don't even have a satisfactory, satisfactory answer for their own soul, or for their own heart, to comfort themselves that everything is all right. That's very sad. Christian people go two ways in answering this. this there are some Christian people that say, well, it won't happen to me. It won't. Happen. That's a very shallow answer. You know, people find it unreasonable, you know, when you say it won't happen to me, you know. Uh, they say it won't happen to me. That's all I know. Uh, some people just leave, leave it at that. But then there are other people, you know, that are not so romantic, you know. They don't, they're not romantic idealists like that. <laughs> they, are, they are people that have had a lot of hope and, And uh, for a life of joy and love, and they were hoping that there was a God, that, that God indeed would help, and that God indeed will come through and, and reach out and help mankind and so on. But now, since they see these things happen, since they see so much evil and suffering, and it's again and again happening, and God is not, God doesn't seem to do anything about it. And it's continuing, the world is full of it all the time. Now they've become cynics. They've become mockers and scoffers. They've become, some of them have become atheists or agnostics. They don't even know what to think. You know, they don't believe in the very idea of God. They doubt the very existence of God. These are the two ways that people go. Some people go that way because uh, the, the other way where they say, well, it won't happen to me. That's all I care about. But there are others that say, well, I was always hoping that God will come through, that I will see a God that's good and just and will intervene, will do something. But he has not done anything. It's still as, as ever and nothing changes. Therefore, I believe that there is no God and I doubt the very existence of God. This is the way things go. <clears throat> Now, are these the only two alternatives that we have? Are... Is there another alternative? I believe there is another alternative and that is the Christian alternative. That is what the Bible teaches and that is what we'll look at today. Now, in order to answer this, we'll begin by answering this question before we even get into this passage and dig into this passage deeply. We'll, we'll just scratch the surface first and answer the problem of evil, problem of evil and suffering, why it's there in the world and what does it tell us about evil. everything and how should a Christian look at suffering in the first place for that we need to look at another passage today you know today not much time I've taken some time just to getting through the to the title of the message I felt that it was good I should explain why I'm tightly it as pinnacle of faith otherwise you'll be wondering so let's turn to the Gospel of John and spend the rest of the time and Just looking at that, Gospel of John, chapter, one, uh, chapter 9, verse 1 onwards. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man 
or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me uh, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which meant sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. All right. Now, in this passage, let's look at the first three verses mainly because that is where this question is put forth. The question that's in the hearts of all people. If God is good, if God is almighty, if God is there, then why is there so much evil and suffering in this world? That question is put forth in the very first few verses. Jesus and his disciples are going around and they meet a man who was born blind. Immediately the disciples come up with a question. This has been in their hearts for a long time, I think. I think just like it's been in our hearts for a long time. When I mentioned this question, I'm sure some of you immediately, your heart said, yeah, I've asked, it. I've asked that very often. I felt like asking someone. I've never had a satisfactory answer. Well, these people also kept that in their heart and it must have bothered them. And all of a sudden when they saw this man born blind, they said, let's ask him. Let's see what he says. So they asked Jesus saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? They're saying, why is this man blind? And it seems like they've come up with a couple of answers by themselves. They've thought about it. And I'm sure the whole world is like that. You know, we have some, we're all philosophers in a way, in our own way. You know, we all sit and think a lot and we come to conclusions about what's happening. So generally in the world, people have come to certain conclusions. And I've, you know, seen that very often, you know, just like these people that are asking the question, in the question itself, their conclusions are revealed. They're looking at this man that is born blind. Immediately they're thinking, well, this guy must be a sinner. This guy must be a sinner. That's why he's like that. How they came to their conclusion? I know how they came to their conclusion. Like one man said, I remember one time, one fellow said, God must have known brother already before he was born that this fellow will be a bad guy. So he gave him blindness because God must have realized that this guy would be a rotten sinner. So he made him blind. This is what the guy said, you know. A lot of people come to conclusions. Otherwise, how would they decide that this man must be a sinner? So they probably thought that God knew that this guy will be, behave badly and that's why he gave him this thing. So they said, maybe he sinned. That's why he's born like that. Then... Sometimes people will say, no, 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 that guy is a really good guy, you know. He doesn't get into any sin. He doesn't have any bad habits. He doesn't go around, run around, do all these things. He's a nice guy. So they must have said, then must be his father. Must be his grandfather. Somebody in the family, they must have sinned. That is why the guy is like that. That's how people conclude, you know. So the same thing has happened here. He must have sinned or his parents must have sinned. It's a very interesting story. And Jesus, in his reply, he gives the reply. He says, neither one is right. 
there are two conclusions that is he sinned or his parents sinned both are wrong he says now let's look at these two ideas that has come these two false ideas that they have about why this man was suffering from this illness that he was blind why is he suffering this evil this why this suffering in this man's life there are two kinds of thinking one is he sinned or the other is father or father sin let me put it like this usually you can put it like this you know that you can call it as anger track and guilt track people take two different paths these two ideas are two different paths that people use in thinking about these things the one path leads them to anger why anger because they believe that their parents have not done the right thing they have wronged them in some way i remember in my days as a student abroad i first encountered this thing that it was fashionable to blame parents you know when i was young i never heard that you know i never i never entertained that idea i never thought parents could be wrong you know even when i was studying in college but when i went to study outside it was very fashionable to blame parents because they were all seeing psychologists psychologists and so on uh, for their mental uh, stress and so on and uh, i guess some of them say because of your parents or because of what they did and so on they all came up with this answer because of my parents so it was very fashionable if you say because of my parents then that means you've seen a psychologist and you reached that conclusion <laughs> that was very new to me blaming the parents because of the parents they didn't do the right thing that's why i'm like this you know now i think in india also this thing has come in now slowly people find it very fashionable to blame parents for their woes now the second way they that leads this leads to the path of anger is when you are suffering if you are a christian especially you not only blame parents you go to the next higher level and blame god himself i'm sure you've seen this i've heard people say wait till i get to heaven i have a question to ask god how can god do this to me what wrong have i done have i not gone to church have i not given what i should give and have i not read the bible have i not read i mean have i not prayed and have i not lived a holy life have i not done the right thing i'm going to ask god why he did this to me why why what wrong have i done <laughs> they think they can't do any wrong god must have done something wrong you know that they are full proof from wrong it's not possible for them to do wrong but it is possible and very well possible for god to do wrong so they want to ask god they blame god and this is something that is very commonly found among christians and among some very spiritual christians right so they blame god then there are other people that blame certain sections of society like certain races certain language groups certain religions certain kinds of people that live among them we all live in a multi ethnic multi religious multilingual society mostly nowadays everywhere you go it's like that so when there is a problem and there is a suffering people attribute it to one section of people it is because of this language group or it is because of this racial group you know and uh, it is because of uh, this um, uh, ethnic group whatever you know so they play this game of blame the blame game so they express anger towards that person or towards god or towards that group and blame them for the suffering that they are undergoing that is one track people come to these conclusions that is one track Uh, these are the people that say that blame the parents they take that track they're, they they have to put their anger and frustration on somebody the parents or somebody like this the other track is the guilt track guilt track is not uh, is where these people are not looking outside to blame somebody they are not trying to blame parents or god or some others 
they are looking inward. These fellows close the door and stay inside and keep looking at themselves inside. And they come to the conclusion, I knew it, you know. I am bad. I am a sinner. And I deserve it. God has only given to me because I deserved it. I am a terrible sinner and this is what I deserve. And God was right. He put it on me because I am a sinner. That is a guilt track. That is terrible. And then there is, I think, third possibility also. I need to mention that. And that is where you mix the anger track and guilt track for your suffering. Especially evident in children that are raised, uh, I mean children uh, that have suffered parents' divorce. Families where parents have divorced, sometimes you will see this. The child is unhappy and angry about the parents. Why did these people marry and then have me as a child and then leave me like this? Why should they torture me like this? This is the anger that comes out from them, you know. Who asked them to do this? And then some grandmother or some auntie or somebody told them, you know, it is when you were in your mother's womb all this problem started. Maybe it has something to do with the bad luck that you have. This problem between husband and wife started way back then when you were conceived and your mother said that she conceived you the next day the problem started. We know that's the problem. You are the problem. And you came out and the man left home. See what you have produced. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and the kid feels terrible and he just is angry at the parents and he's angry at himself. He's got the anger track and the guilt track going together and it's very lethal, you know. It can explode any time. He can explode and, and it's, a, it's not something to be laughed at. It's, some, it's something very sad. And you see that all over the world these days, kids suffering from this anger and frustration of their own guilt, that they might be the reason why the divorce happened in the family and so on. So these are the normal pathways that people take. They either go the route of anger or they take the route of guilt. But what does Jesus say? Look at the answer of Jesus in verse 3. The disciples said, was it, is it, is it, it, uh, was it the man who sinned or his parents that he was born blind? What is the reason for his suffering? Jesus answered, verse 3, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says, neither one of your conclusions is right. It's not the parents and it's not the man. So don't take the anger track or the guilt track. Don't be angry at somebody that parents or God or somebody else <coughs> for your problems, for your sufferings. And don't blame yourself and beat yourself. It is neither he that sinned nor his parents. Jesus says both of them are wrong. Both answers are wrong. Now, I think if you read another passage here, you will understand why that answer that Jesus gave is right. You will see it more clearly. Luke chapter 13, very interesting story here. Luke chapter 13. It's amazing that Jesus addresses this big question in so many places. Luke chapter 13. Verse 4 onwards. Luke 13, 4. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders or worse sinners than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? <laughs> See, in a place called Siloam in Jerusalem, one major disaster happened. A tower fell. And it fell on 18 people and killed them. It must have been a worldwide news in those days. Terrible disaster. 18 people killed. And Jesus is asking the question, in that thing where 18 people were killed in that accident, do you think that they were worse sinners 
than all the others who lived in Jerusalem. See, he is hitting them right where it hurts. They are thinking like that. That's why Jesus is asking. Because these guys are thinking, well, it fell on the 18 people. Who knows what these guys were doing? They must be sinners. That's why it fell on their head. That's the thinking of the society. They are thinking, well, it didn't fall on anybody's head. Just those 18. They must have been terrible sinners. They are worse sinners than all the rest of us. That's why it fell on them. And Jesus hits them right where it hurts. He says, do you think that they are worse sinners than the others? And then he answers it himself. He says, no, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Let me put it in a very simple way. He says, no, your answer is wrong. Your conclusion is wrong. You are thinking that they were worse sinners than others. In Jerusalem. I say no. That is not the reason. You and them. You are all the same. It could have very well fallen on you. You better be glad that it didn't fall on you. And kill you. You better be thankful. That you were not the person. That died under that tower. Falling. Now that, that must have been a shock to those people. Because it was a traditional way of thinking. Well if it fell on his head. Well, he must have done something wrong. That's why it fell on his head. You know, <laughs> this whole thing, uh, this whole thing again is faced in the story of story of Job. You know, everyone knows the story of Job and the famous story of Job's suffering. He goes through a lot of suffering. He loses his children, loses his property, loses his cattle. Everything burns down. And one after the other, it happens in quick succession. Loses everything. Except his wife, he loses everything. And finally feels like it would have been better if he lost his wife also. Because she's not a great help. <laughs> she's telling him, why don't you curse God and die, you know. Now why do you want a wife like that with you when you're suffering? So he's feeling that this woman, you know, <laughs> is such a difficult thing at this time. And right at that time, see, he is, he is blaming God for that. He thought, why me? Have I not lived a righteous life? Have I not done the right thing? I've offered sacrifices in the morning, sacrifices in the evening. I've done the right thing. I've always feared God. Maybe my children have done something wrong, but I've always lived for God. Why hit me? Why is such disaster one after the other in my home? Why should I lose everything? And be left only with my wife. I don't know which one was the bigger problem for him. Losing everything or having the wife. You know. I think both was equal problem. <laughs> Why me? Why me Lord? Is the famous question a lot of people ask. <laughs> and then he's got three friends. And I hope that none of you have friends like this. They show up. And basically, these guys are saying, hey, look, we're all living for God. We're all fine. Man, we're so blessed and praise God, you know. We're doing fine. Why did this happen to you? Must be something wrong. Maybe you're doing something wrong. Examine your heart. See what you're doing wrong. It must be something wrong that you did. <laughs> so he's blaming himself. He's taking the guilt track. And the Three people that came to him, the friends, they were all, you know, blaming him for any wrongdoing. And uh, going that route. And God shows up in the end. I have often preached from chapter 38, 39. It's a very interesting chapter leading up to the end in chapter 42. When God shows up, amazing what God says. Finally, Job shut up. He said, I will shut up. I will put my hand in my mouth, he says, and I'll shut up because I've spoken things that are too wonderful for me to understand. Things that I don't understand, I've blabbered. I'm a blabber mouth. I will shut my mouth. I will not talk. You talk, God. And that makes a lot of sense. I guess I wish that a lot of people did that, you know. These people that say, I want to ask God, why me? Why me, Lord, and all that. He said, I will shut up, let God speak. And when God started speaking, his life started turning around. Amazing what God speaks. And I don't want to go into it because those are different sermons that I've preached. 
on those those things but god rebukes both job and his friends because both their conclusions are wrong job thinking that job being angry with god and taking the angry track is wrong job saying god why did you do it to me what wrong have i done that is wrong and job taking the guilt track also is wrong because everybody is putting guilt on him they're saying you must have something wrong you must have done something wrong that's the guilt track so they're putting the angry track and guilt track on him while he was having the greatest trouble in his life and god says both of you guys are wrong and rebukes them literally and then finally everything that he had was restored twice as much all that he lost was restored back to him so both these ideas are wrong jesus says it very clearly here you are you guys are wrong it's not his parents or it's not him it's not his sin or his parents sin then what is it then what has brought about it the bible gives the answer if you read from genesis chapter 3 the answer is very clear what is the answer the answer is this that sufferings are there in this world evil is there in this world today not because of our particular sins that are, that we do now in our lives it's not like god is scoring us on every thing that we do and keeping track of everything that do and every time that we do wrong he is slapping something on us punishing us therefore we suffer that's that, that idea is completely wrong the bible says suffering and evil has entered into the world as a result of adam's sin so you cannot in a simplistic way say this man must have sinned therefore he is suffering that is that is a very simplistic conclusion it is wrong the bible teaches that all suffering comes from sin in general that is the sin of adam in the beginning that has affected the entire human race and the entire creation all things flow from that sickness death family problems problems at work problems where you work more and earn little where you have to eat by the sweat of your brow all of this came as a curse as a result of adam's sin it is affecting humanity in the spirit soul and body in the work of their hands in their family life in all areas of life it is affecting people today so all suffering today that we experience as human beings are not coming from particular sins that we have done they are coming from sin in general that adam did in the beginning it is flowing from that See, when God created man, He created him as a to have an important part in life in in the life of this world. It's like everything was created and was placed under man, man's authority. He was placed as the Lord over all creation. Man was. So when man sinned, it was like the central part of creation. the most important part of it it's like a you take a clock somewhere and it's got a main thing is that machine that makes it run when something goes wrong it it may have needle and may have look beautiful and all that but it just can't run right because the main thing that makes it work and keep the time is gone wrong something like that happened when adam sinned he was supposed to play the key role when he goes wrong everything goes wrong from that time nothing works properly in this world everything has gone wrong with creation creation is not in the condition that it was in the beginning it has suffered as a result of man's sin the bible says the creation is longing for its redemption to come even man is longing for his redemption to come nothing works right nature will not ever work again properly until god completely fixes this at the end now 
all of creation, all of man's life, the world is completely affected. It, we are subject to disease, decay, death. We are subject to natural disasters. Why? Because man has decided to leave God out, chuck God out of his life. And man has decided to run his own life, be his own God. That is what a sin is all about. Sin is not that you killed somebody or robbed a banker. That is all a result of sin. These things happen, so many sins happen. But the sin itself, the mother of all sins is the rejection of God. and god's authority over our life and god's leadership over our lives that we fail to subject ourselves to god we live our own life that is what sin is that's what adam's sin was and that has resulted in untold suffering and evil in this world so you must never think of evil and suffering in terms of particular sins of somebody it is about the sin of adam that is what i mean when i say sin in general not sin in particular if some people's idea is right that it is because of this sin that this man sinned that this happened if that is right then i'll tell you my friend that if god keeps score cards and settles scores every day like some people settle accounts every day if god kept score cards on our wrong doings and settled his score every day and gave us and meted out the appropriate proportionate punishment every day there will be nobody here including the preacher <laughs> that's how much we are all dependent upon the grace of god thank god thank god that these things are not working in proportion to our sin <laughs> our sin was so great <laughs> even this fallen world god is so gracious so that our mango trees will come up with mangoes in may our fields give us the crops that we need so that we can eat our food even in a fallen condition even in our fallen fallen condition we see so much beauty on this earth in some of the countries you go and see amazing beautiful sceneries you know in a fallen world just imagine what the world would have been like if it was not marred by sin and affected by sin how perfectly right it must have been So it's wrong to think it's unreasonable to think that because of my sin god has done this you know that kind of thing is very sickening and it's very wrong we should not think like that so evil has come in and there is chaos everywhere in life in every area of life and god is sitting there and saying this is not my design evil is not my design chaos is not my design undoing the chaos was his design he undid the chaos and the emptiness and darkness and filled it with every good thing that was his design so god is sitting there saying, this is not my design the world that you have now filled with so much evil and suffering is not my design god says it's all a result of sin in general sin of adam that is that is what has resulted in this so what should be the approach of the christians to suffering and evil what is the approach of christians to suffering and evil when we experience evil in this world suffering in this world are you surprised that so much evil and suffering is there one fellow said to me oh i can't believe how much evil and suffering is there in this world never never expected i said where have you been all this time you never expected suffering and evil in this world what do you expect my friend other than suffering and evil you must be happy for every good thing that comes out in this world because good things are rare sufferings and evil is plenty because this is a fallen world 
this is what you get that is why suffering and evil is there you should if you are surprised then uh, you know you've not been noticing the world as you ought to it's there only if you are not suffering and if you are not suffering any evil then you have to pinch yourself and see whether you've died and gone to heaven you know you've gone to heaven there won't be any suffering and evil but as long as you are on this earth there will be suffering and evil because the world is a world of sin therefore it is crowded with suffering and evil it is filled more and more with suffering and evil so first of all you should not be surprised you should not read the papers and look at tv and say my god what's happening no well don't be surprised this is what will happen because sin is rampant man's iniquities are bringing forth these things these are the fruits of man's sin that is there in this world and we are caught in the middle of all of that we are living in the middle of all of that that is why we need more of god that is why we need to cling to god and be close to god what do you expect in a world like this there is suffering and evil so how do you approach suffering and evil a christian must first of all understand if there is suffering in your life in any way it is not because god is punishing me hello it's not because god is trying to slap me on my face you know because all my punishments the bible says has been placed upon jesus christians must first learn that it's not because god is trying to punish me because all my punishment has been placed upon jesus all of it god would may, never take two payments for debt my debt has already been paid and he is not asking me to come and make the payment second time by suffering hello he does not want me to suffer he does not he is not interested in making me suffer he is not interested in slapping suffering on me because he doesn't take two payments for one debt he is not going to punish jesus for my sin and then punish me also a christian first of all understand suffering is there in this world because of sin of adam sin in general because there is sin in general there is sinfulness in general in this world that is why suffering don't just beat yourself with it there is sinfulness ever since the sin of adam there is sinfulness in this world everywhere there is sin filled with sin and that is why there is suffering therefore i know that if there is suffering in my life he is not punishing me for my sin and jesus is my redeemer and he takes even my sufferings and turns it into something good that is what a redeemer does so in the midst of suffering as i live my life in suffering and suffering through this thing and going through the suffering of this life my redeemer shows up right in the middle see that is why the stories of shadrach meshach and abednego in the fiery furnace and daniel in the lions den is told like that and i think we went beyond the sunday school level and it's so important you know after shadrach meshach and abednego were thrown in the king looks in and he sees four people there walking as if they are strolling in a park and he calls his officials and says did we not thrown three people how come there's four and the fourth one is like the son of man who is the fourth man the fourth man is jesus the son of the living god appearing there in the midst of the furnace and he calls them out and only three people come out and then in the end the third chapter that story is there in daniel in the end the last the the verse before the last verse the king nebuchadnezzar himself says in his own words there is no god that saves like this god so i say to you 
the story is told in that way why in that way means the story could have gone some other way the story for example could have gone like this you know that nebuchadnezzar ordered three people to be thrown into the fire and all of a sudden he had a heart attack and died he died there on the spot and everybody thought oh god had killed him wonderful our god is a living god it didn't happen like that it could have gone like that or it could have gone where when order was placed that they should be thrown in the fire that all the babylonians died that god will strike them dead it never happened like that in fact god waited till they heated the furnace even more and it was so hot that the people that threw the three men were killed because of the heat but when these men fell inside the fiery furnace they were taking a stroll in there with the fourth man why does our god save like this why does the story go like this why didn't the story go that the other way where that they don't have to fall into the fiery furnace we all like that you know oh will god keep me from the fiery furnace well he can but but this time the story didn't go like that they were in the fiery furnace why in the fiery furnace because without being in the fiery because without these people being in the fiery furnace and without the fourth man jesus entering into the fiery furnace you cannot really tell the gospel see this is the gospel story you cannot tell the gospel what is the gospel our world is like a fiery furnace we are in the furnace we are experiencing the furnace problem and trouble everywhere evil and suffering is everywhere we are in that furnace and into the furnace 2000 years ago came our savior from heaven the son of god he came and lived with us he was among us and even today the risen christ lives in us he is part of our lives he walks with us he talks with us when we sing that song he walks with me talks with me we really mean it he is walking with us talking with us in this fiery furnace in this troubled world in the world of darkness and sin jesus christ walks with us every step of the way that's the gospel my friend there is no god that saves like this god he is right there so if you are suffering from problems if you are suffering if you are suffering any kind of suffering that you are going through in any aspect of your life remember first of all you are suffering because of the general sin that is there general sinfulness that is there in this world the general nature of this world is like that this is not god's design god didn't design you to suffer but man sin has brought about a sinful world and we suffer because of that and god because he pities us and has compassion on us in our suffering he wants to save us help us he joins us in that furnace when he joined shadrach meshach and abednego in the furnace there was not even the smell of fire on them it did not even touch them because the son of god was there with them protecting them from that furnace quenched the horror of that fire i believe that's the same one that was in lions den with daniel they say daniel was at least 80 or 90 years old when they threw him in the lions den but there was a mighty angel of god that shut the mouths of lion right there the one who was there in the lions den the one who was there in the fiery furnace is with us today he walks with you through your suffering he goes with you you never need to feel that when you are suffering you need to understand it's not god against you it is god for you he has come and entered into your furnace he is living with you he is walking with you he is there with you he will be a great help to you he will save you deliver you and all that 
and even if your life is taken he is there with you walks from this life takes you to the next life keeps you safe and then one day unites your body that was dead in this world with you and gives you back as an immortal being completely in perfect shape he is with you all the way my friend even death does not mean that god has given up on you death does not mean that it's the final chapter death does not mean it's defeat jesus said don't fear the one who can kill you and do nothing more than that we don't fear the one who kills the one who has the power to kill because we believe in the one who has the power to give life he can kill a thousand times but our god can give give life each time he can cut us into thousand pieces but our god can put us back together again and again and again and again so that is how you face suffering you face suffering in that way are you there <laughs> he is with us he hates the suffering he is unhappy with the pain it's not his design see that's the clear way clear cut way in which a christian ought to think anything else is not right some people te- teach as if god is increasing the heat you know they depict god like nebuchadnezzar you know <laughs> wrong you got the wrong person there <laughs> nebuchadnezzar is not in your life when you are suffering god is there god is there with you jesus christ is there all right but now go back to john chapter 3 and let me close it john chapter 9 verse 3 So he answers the question of the disciples. It is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That the works of God might be displayed in him. What does he mean by the works of God being displayed in him? See, when suffering happens, I told you God is with you, just like Shadrach, Meshach, Nebuchadnezzar, Abednego had a fourth man. He's there with you, walks with you, talks with you. He comforts you, strengthens you. is there with you under all circumstances and you are under his protection ultimate evil cannot happen to you nobody can completely destroy you you will have the ultimate victory joseph under joseph i believe understood it better than anybody else if you turn with me to chapter 50 of genesis i'll just read one verse before we close remember joseph everybody knows the story of joseph so i'm not going i'm going to go into it his life looks like it went through so much trouble so many years as a slave he spent in potiphar's house then he was blamed for something he never did even being sold as a slave it was not something that wrong that he did the only wrong only wrong that he did was he god showed him a vision and he revealed it and that brothers were jealous of him that god is going to take him to some heights in life so they wanted to get rid of him and they sold him as a slave to the to the egyptians and he lands up in potiphar's house and then from potiphar's house he was blamed for some sin that he never did and thrown into prison and there he spends a couple of years 2 3 years just imagine languishing in a jail 2 3 years as a young man and before that languishing in a potiphar's house as a slave working there what is happening to my life that is suffering a young man would think what in the world is happening i've lived for god i love god what is happening to my life so much suffering why why lord why me should be the question of everyone that goes through that but joseph doesn't seem to have that question joseph seems to be so loyal to god even when there was an opportunity for sinning he rejects that he said i cannot do it before god it's not right i don't want to do it because before god i live he is committed to god in the midst of all the suffering he is truthful to god he is attached to god he is close to god as a result he ends up as the prime minister of the country second only to the king he ends up and then 
his family who was suffering from famine, seventy people of his family, his brothers and their families, father, everybody moves to Egypt in the best part of the land. They are given the best of Egypt and lives very comfortably. They lived in prosperity and peace for many years there. Joseph dies. I mean, uh, Jacob dies in the end. And when Jacob dies, the other brothers are now afraid because they thought. Until our father was there, our brother didn't do anything against us. He must have something against us. See, they're thinking like the world, you know. That guy will have a lot of thing, a lot of hatred towards us because of what we did to him. Now that our father is dead, he's going to come after us, kill us, disown us, do something against us. So they go and fall at his feet, say, "We are all your slaves. Please don't do anything." And he cries. And look at what he says to them in verse twenty. It shows what kind of understanding he had about his suffering, how he looked at his suffering, and how he saw his suffering. He suffered much, but how did he see his suffering? Look at this, verse twenty. As for you, you meant evil against me, huh? See, in one family, the brothers couldn't be together. That's what sin has done to this world, you know. In one family, we couldn't just live together safely and securely in friendship with one another, in closeness with one another. One family is divided like they go to the point of murdering him. They're ready to murder him. He says, "You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive." As they are today, he said, "You meant it for bad, but God brought me here. You know why? God wanted our whole family to be saved, the seventy people, and our descendants should be saved because Savior is going to be born through us. He wanted us to be preserved. God has brought us here to save all of us. God has used this evil that you did because God is a redeemer." A redeemer means you now, like when you go and pledge some jewelry or something, and you are not able to redeem it back because you are not able to pay the money. Some wealthy man may come into your life and say, "Come on, I'll come and help you," and he pays the money and gets it back. That's the way redemption happens. What has happened to us in redemption? This is exactly what has happened, and what happens to us in suffering? The redeemer shows up again. He's there, right there with us. In our suffering, what does the Redeemer do? He redeems everything that we lost, everything that is damaged, everything that has crumbled. Now is built back by Him. The Redeemer makes everything right. In the end, the Bible says there will not be one blind man, there will not be one deaf man, there will not be one sick man. Why? Because the Redeemer will make everything right. The works of God were manifest on that day when Jesus healed that man by putting mud on his face. The works of God was revealed in his healing, but that was just one man's healing. There were many more blind. There were still blind, but there is coming a day when there will be no blind. God is going to return the creation to its original state. He's going to do away with the. Ruin that sin has caused and return it back to its original condition. That is what this is all about. He says, Jesus says, "Yeah, you see the results of sin rampantly everywhere, but you will see through that one day the glory of God. You will see the manifest works of God." How God will make everything right. Even the creation is suffering. God will turn everything back to its original condition. The works of God will be displayed through this. You will see in the end when God returns everything to its original glory that how good God is and how powerful God is, how great God is. So here he says, "You meant it for evil, but God used that evil and turned it into good." That's what a redeemer does. He uses. Whatever bad is done and turns it into evil. In your situation and my situation, that's what happens. In Tamil, it's come out beautifully. Yella vatti nanmeyaga mudiya seidar. Nanmeyaga mudiya seidar means God caused everything to work for our good in the end. The same as Romans eight twenty eight. 
all things to work together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purposes ellavathiyum nanmaiyai mudiy seyar seida that means everything worked out for our best that's what he is saying that's exactly what joseph is saying you meant it for evil but everything in the end look how wonderfully it's worked out do you believe that in your suffering that god is working out the best for you the outcome in the end will be the best for you it will be the finest thing it will be the greatest thing it is something more beyond anything that you could ever imagine god will make everything beautiful and wonderful i believe that do you believe that amen let's all stand together let's lift up our hands and give thanks to god father god in the name of jesus we come we thank you lord for the revelation of your truth i pray that you will give us the heart and the mind to understand and grasp these things and i pray that you will help us to see you in the midst of our sufferings in this world in the midst of every struggle that we go through in the midst of every need in the midst of every problem and challenge that we face i pray that from this day people will be conscious of the fourth man in the midst the other person that always is there as a factor in our life jesus christ who lives with us who walks with us talks with us carries us through he is our comfort and our strength our wisdom and our everything we thank you lord help us to experience that today and we know that even when things look bad today it things look like it's failing and it's against us and it is working against us we know that in the end everything will be beautiful that it will be for our benefit it will be for our good because you always work things for our good you have our good in our in your mind thank you father we give you all the glory and honor and praise in jesus name we pray now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of the father the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore amen